Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Slouching Towards Thatcham podcast, which highlights the work and the voices of the UK's best parent bloggers. I'm Tim from Slouching Towards Thatcham, a blog about life as a father of three. Every week I feature a guest blogger who talks about and reads one of their favourite posts, and I do the same with one of mine. It's as simple as that, bite-sized chunks of blogging brilliance. This week I'm delighted to be joined by Ryan, the dad behind the blog Dad Creek Without a Paddle. Hi there Ryan. Hi. Why don't we kick off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and the blog. Sure, well I'm Ryan and I'm a 29 year old married father of two living in the heart of England. Uh, I've blogged on and off for a couple of years, taking breaks from time to time. Uh, I blog as a hobby and for occasional self-therapy. Most importantly, though, I blog to document our everyday family life and record memories. Uh, I feel as though a lot of families pull out their photo albums from Christmas, weddings and big summer holidays. It's all the small things get forgotten about. So blogging allows me to make sure those ordinary but precious moments are still captured and held on to and that's what I try and do. And I think certainly a lot of us fellow bloggers would empathise with those feelings. Now you're going to be reading a deeply personal post for us today. Could you just give us a little bit of background to it? Yeah, the the blog post that I'm going to read for you today was a shock to practically every one of my readers. I admitted to suffering from depression in it. Uh, when in fact nobody had a clue at the time. When I initially started blogging, my wife was pregnant for the first time and I used it as a way of putting my thoughts on paper whilst getting to grips with the idea of becoming a first-time father. I've always been better at writing my thoughts down than saying them out loud and this post was all about me getting back to my roots with that, stepping away from happy photos and memories and just letting my mind spill into text really. Okay, the floor is yours now. Fire away. My secret battle with depression. I was recently told that it takes so much more energy pretending to be okay than it does to admit that you have a problem and agree to fight it. It takes so much more energy to keep a secret than it does to just be open, honest and not care what the world thinks of you. Hearing that made sense to me. And so if anyone else struggling stumbles across this post then know that I'm about to be open and honest, just so you can see that it can be done. Let go and take back your life. You deserve it. Here goes. I'm depressed. I was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety disorder almost a year ago, though it's almost definitely been around for a lot longer, and I wear a mask to cover it up. I live in pain and suffer in silence, pretending to be okay. It's hard hard work. It's hard telling people you're okay when you're not. It's hard to smile and play with your children when you hit a bump in the road and find yourself having the lowest of days. It's hard pulling yourself out of bed when you feel as though you didn't deserve to wake up. It's hard when you find yourself wishing death on yourself and then you look around at what you'd leave behind and get swallowed whole by a wave of guilt. But most of all, it's hard lying about it. I lie about it because of the awful stigma attached to mental illness and the various treatments for them. Being ill makes me feel like a failure. I lie about it because it's impossible to explain. I have no idea why I'm depressed. I don't know what my triggers are, and I'm not unhappy with my life. That probably makes very little sense to most of you, but most of you have no idea about mental illness. It's science. It's no difficult to a physical illness. My brain is effectively missing the connectors between itself and the nerves, and in turn, that blocks the majority of happy signals and chemicals from reaching where they're aimed at. That means I don't see, hear, or feel most good things the same way that you do. Why that is, I don't know. And because I can't explain it, I just pretend that it isn't happening to me. I lie about it because even the friends, family or colleagues I have dropped hints to have made me feel ten times worse without even knowing they're doing it. They might say things like, but you have nothing to be depressed about, you have it all. 
Pull yourself together. You'll be okay. Why? What's the matter? You don't need to see a therapist. I'm sure they've got that wrong. Whatever you do, don't go on any tablets. That's the last thing you want. In fact, the last thing I want is to live out the rest of my life the way I am doing now and feeling the way I'm feeling. The last thing I want is to be half the man, half the husband, half the friend, and half the father I could be because I'm so close to exploding every single day. Mental illnesses are real, and they should be treated with the respect they deserve. But we're so uneducated that the majority of us can't even begin to relate. If any of my family members fell and broke their leg and wanted to refuse a cast to have it fixed, then I'd be pleading with them to see sense. So why then would anyone go out of their way to tell me not to accept the medication that is being recommended to help fight the illness that's burdening me in every aspect of my life? Depression. Depression is a bastard. Depression clouds the sun to make sure you live your life in a permanent state of darkness. Depression has me hating myself so much that I hate anyone that thinks any different about me. I actively feel hatred and anger towards people that love me. Depression has me purposefully avoid mirrors because of how ugly I look and how fat that I am. But that same depression has me refusing to eat healthy or exercise because it makes me not actually want to improve or get better. It has me believing that I don't deserve to get better. Depression is why I can sit and not move, feeling weighted down by self-hate, unable to see the good in anything in front of me. Depression is why I rarely see my friends or my family. No one ever asks me if I'm okay, and although that bothers me, I really don't want them to either. I don't want people to care, because depression has me believing that I don't deserve to be cared about. I don't want to be asked. It only makes me lie again, and that leads to guilt, to anger, and to hating myself even more. The circles are as vicious as you could ever imagine. Depression is what lives under the mask that I wear for you every day. But why lie? Is lying about it better than fighting it? When it comes to lying about it, justifying and mastering coping mechanisms, I've realized that they're all for the benefit of other people. All of those things are hard to do and for the wrong reasons. Three weeks ago, I signed an imaginary contract with my therapist because I couldn't convince him with any of my words that I wouldn't kill myself before our next appointment. I came home, I told my wife, and we both cried. That was harder than lying, coping, or justifying, but at least it was for the right reasons. It served a purpose. I'd been counselling for months, but that for me was the first step on the ladder to getting better. That was me openly admitting that I had a problem, and I knew it had to be addressed. Six months ago, I published right here on my blog a list of New Year's resolutions, and on that list, I dropped a subtle hint as to what might be going on. I told myself and anyone who was prepared to read that day that I would look to get help, and that's I'm right about it. Well, here I am. I'm writing about it. I've seeked help, and I could not care any less about the stigma attached to all the opinion of others. I'm a husband and a father, but more importantly, I'm a human being. A human being with one shot at life, and I need to make sure that I get better, whether I think I deserve to or not. Ryan, thank you for your openness and courage, uh, first in terms of writing this post in the first place, uh, and then in agreeing to read it for us in, in your own voice. I mean, depression is something that can affect anyone, and posts like this are so important in terms of raising understanding of an issue that's far from uncommon. So thank you very much for taking the time to come and join me on this week's podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to read more of Ryan's writing, go to his blog Dad Creek Without a Paddle at dadcreek.com or follow him on Twitter at costyy2k. That's C O S T Y Y number 2 K. 
I'll attach links to both those addresses and to the post he's just read on the show notes over on slouchingtowardsthatchem.com. Ryan's post eloquently highlighted his personal battle with depression, a subject that for a long time was considered taboo. For my post this week, I'm going to talk about my own experience with another topic that, in my family at least, has also been something we've never really talked about, namely infant mortality. This is a post that took me more than three years and about a dozen rewrites to complete. It's called The Brother Who Never Was. If you've been following my blog for a while, you'll have probably heard me talk about my younger brother Peter, who to my children is just cool Uncle Pete. Technically though, I'm not one of two brothers. I'm one of three. We never talk about Michael. The brother who never was. Michael was my other brother. The brother I never had a chance to grow up with. The son my parents never had the opportunity to raise. Born in the spring of 1974, he lived for only a few days. Infant mortality was much more common back then. He would have turned 40 recently. I'm not actually sure exactly when his birthday was. I know my dad used to have his birth date as one of his regular numbers on his football pools coupon, but otherwise we've never marked the day or even spoken openly about it as a family. Without Michael, there would have been no Peter. I know my mother was distraught after Michael's death, although we've never spoken about it, and she was desperate for another child. Both my parents come from large families. She was nearly 39 when Peter arrived. Although that's not especially old to give birth now, Heather was only a couple of months younger when Cara was born, it was rare in those days. My mother has always been a determined woman. The brother who is. Peter wasn't the healthiest baby at birth, and was subsequently hospitalised on a few occasions with childhood asthma attacks. Mum was understandably, compulsively protective of him. She still is. I didn't take the resultant shift in attention to Peter well. I didn't appreciate why it had to be that way until my late twenties. In truth, it hasn't been until I became a father myself that I fully understood how all-consuming the instinct to protect our children is. Being a mother who has suffered the loss of a child... I can only imagine how that feels. The gap in age, six years, didn't help our relationship. We weren't the worst of enemies, but neither were we the best of friends. And while we're not finish each other's sentences close, we get on well now. The brother who might have been. With Michael, the difference would have been three and a half years between us. What kind of bond might I have formed with him? I see one possible scenario every day. Isaac and Toby are closer together in age, 25 months apart, and although, like my brother and I, they are very different personalities, they are also practically inseparable. They do things apart, of course, but they also do so many things together. Without getting too maudlin about it, I see in the way Isaac is with Toby how things might have been for me with Michael. What might have been? So what does the brother, who never was, mean to me now? It's made me acutely conscious of wanting to build good memories for my children. In a previous post, I talked about my childhood memory of walking to the station with my dad on a cold morning. It's one of my earliest memories, and also one of my saddest, because it relates to the brief time my mother was in hospital with Michael. Also, Because I never saw Michael, or if I did, I don't remember it, I never got the chance to form even a fleeting image of him. To all intents and purposes, he never existed. No photos, no keepsakes, just a name, a birth certificate, and presumably a death certificate too, and an empty space that none of us ever acknowledges. 
no memories to hold on to, only an occasional thought of what might have been. After years of not really thinking, and certainly never talking about Michael, I don't really know what else to say, other than that, for a brother I never knew, I miss him very, very much. And that's it for this episode of the Slouching Towards Thatcham podcast. If you'd like to listen to either future or previous episodes, you'll find them published on the blog, and also on iTunes and various other podcasting sites. You can follow me on the blog at slouchingtowardsthatcham.com, on Twitter at Thatcham Dad, and on various other social media channels. You'll find links to all of the above, plus Ryan's links, in the show notes on the blog. All that remains is for me to say thank you all for listening to this podcast, and hopefully you'll join me again next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.